When Jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father Through Jesus the Son And give Him the Great things he had done. The song before we have uh, the prayer before the Bible class is song 443. The precious book divine. Song 443. How precious is the book divine by inspiration give. Bright as a lamp its precept shine to guide my soul to have holy book divine. Precious treasure mine to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. It sweetly cheers my drooping heart in this dark veil of tears. Light to my life it still imparts and tells my rising fears. Holy Book Divine, precious treasure mine, lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. This lamp through all the tedious night of life shall guide my way till I behold the clearer light of an eternal day. Holy Book Divine, precious treasure mine, lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you've blessed us with where we can come together to um, sing songs of praise to you, to uh, hear a lesson uh, from uh, your word and uh, to later be able to worship you. And uh, we pray that um, as we uh, go into this time of uh, Bible class and Bible study, that uh, we'll be uh, attentive uh, to the things that are taught and that uh, the teachers may be able to recall the things that they've prepared and that we may be attentive and uh, seek to um, develop and gain a better understanding of what your word teaches and to look at lessons and applications that we can learn for us today, that we can put into practice so that we can um, always be uh, living our lives uh, the best we can as you would have us to. We ask that you'll please be with those who are not uh, with us yet, whether they're still traveling or are not feeling well. We pray that you'll uh, look after them and that we may be able to see them soon. We ask that you'll be with us now and we pray these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very good morning to everyone here today, as well as those who are streaming online. So the week before last, Trevor has kicked us off on the new series on the book of Hosea. 
he covered a great overview of the book and he also walked us through chapter one. So today we'll be continuing on chapter two. But as usual, before we delve into it, uh, let's have a recap of what we have learned uh, previously. So we know that Hosea is one of the minor prophets, uh, but it's not because his message of, uh, is of minor significance, but it's more because, um, or rather the length of the book, it has 14 chapters, so it's relatively short if you compare to books like um, the book of Isaiah. And now, a question for everybody here. What does the name Hosea mean? What does the name Hosea mean? If you don't know, uh, ask Trevor. It's on his slides last time. Yeah, so it means salvation, help, or deliverance. Um, second question, during whose reign did Hosea prophesy? Ignore the grammar mistake there. It was late night. But you can find that in Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. During whose reign did Hosea uh, prophesy? Yeah. So he had a rather long ministry. So from the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. So they're the kings of Judah, uh, the southern kingdom. And in verse 1, he also mentioned uh, Jeroboam II, who reigned around, uh, this, around 786 to 746 BC in the kingdom of Israel. So that's the northern kingdom. Um, but there were six other kings of Israel after Jeroboam that Hosea left out. Um, it's probably because their reign is relatively short. Uh, you have one, you serve the other. All right, so Hosea began his ministry possibly around 783 BC and ended during Hezekiah's rule uh, in 715 to 687 BC. And most scholars place the, the time of his work around 750 to 725 BC. So given this timeline, he was possibly a young man when Amos was uh, almost through his uh, ministry. So you can see the two red lines, that's his period. And the timeline would also place him around the same time as Isaiah and Micah, uh, but their target audience was uh, the southern kingdom, Judah. So, both Amos and Hosea prophesied to Israel, the northern kingdom, and both Isaiah and Micah were prophesying in Judah, the southern kingdom. The first half of the 8th century BC was a period of prosperity and strength for both the northern and southern kingdoms. And why is that so? Why, were they, uh, why was it a period of prosperity? So before the period that Hosea was active, there was an Assyrian king who was powerful and led several uh, military campaigns and deaths. Adad Nirari II, he launched a war conquest uh, that captured much of the Babylonian kingdom. So basically he was a powerful king. But after his death, Assyria entered a period of weakness and they paid less attention to what was happening uh, in the region of Palestine. So when a cat is away, the mice is out to play. And as a result of this, um, the time of Jeroboam, the time of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, these are the time of the greatest prosperity of the divided kingdom. And in the north, um, you have Jeroboam II. He had extended the Israel's borders through several military operations. And uh, the prophet Amos warned about uh, complacency in Amos chapter 6, verse 13 where the triumphs of the, kings, uh, of the king had made him boastful and overconfident in his own military strength. So let's read that. Amos 6, verse 13. You who rejoice over Lord Debar, who said, Have we not taken Kanam for ourselves by our own strength? So Israel's pride in its military strength would be its downfall. And then also uh, in the south, you have Uzziah, who, who had also strengthened uh, the, Judean, uh, the Judah's army and defeated the nation's enemy. So you can read that in your own time in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 3 to verse 15. Uh, so that describes his, uh, the early days uh, of his reign where um, he was building uh, and strengthening the army, building uh, forts and uh, towers. Um, but he too got too proud uh, at the latter, latter days and became a leper. So we can see here that both the North and the South were enjoying a great deal of prosperity and uh, military success. And this is where Hosea was prophesying, during, this, uh, during the greatest time of the divided uh, kingdom. 
And of course, his pleas fell on deaf ears, but little did they know that trouble was coming. And according to 2 Kings, uh, God's revenge on Israel was not long in coming. And the instrument of his wrath was the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, who reigned um, in 745 to 727 BC. So what happened was he eventually invaded Israel and defeated King Pekah's coalition, capturing Kadesh, Hazor, uh, Gilead and Galilee and all the land of Naphtali. And he carried the people captive to Assyria. So you can read that in 2 Kings 15 to 29. So as the book of Hosea makes it clear, um, idolatry, especially worship of the Canaanite god Baal, was widespread in the northern kingdom. So imagine your, uh, uh, your country or your kingdom is celebrating military success, trades are going well, people are prospering, um, and here comes Hosea, a doom and gloom news bearer, tells you that you're playing harlotry and tell you that you need to repent. Um, so it's sort of like talking to the air. People don't listen. People don't want to hear your doom and gloom news because uh, we are living the, the life right now. And the people had forgotten God. They think that what they've accomplished was uh, done by their own hands. And worse, they attribute their harvest and fertility to Baal, which is a pagan god that brings on fertility, fertile land and women, and usually involves uh, sexual rituals. And these are all against God's laws. So in ancient Israel, farmers or their wives would visit the shrines of fertility idols, such as the Phoenician Astate, I think the one on the right, um, to mate with temple prostitutes in hope of securing a good harvest. And Astate was also revered as the goddess of sexual love. By contrast, Asherah, the one on the left, um, was an Arcadian mother goddess. Some scholars have argued that during that period, she was sometimes revered as Yahweh's consort and worship as queen of heaven. So that may explain why the, um, the cult persisted, um, regardless of uh, what the prophets has told them. And that is why in Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 2, God says that they are corrupt and brought a charge against them. So let's read together. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraints with bloodshed upon bloodshed. And as we can see throughout the study of uh, the book of Hosea, there's a lot of back and forth where God will bring a charge against Israel by yet offering them salvation and pleading his people to repent and come back to him. So it's like a parent disciplining their kids for doing something wrong, but being patient and waiting for them to realize that they're in the wrong and repent and come back to him. Yes, Shane. Ah, so that could be the, the one that they're referring to. Or something similar. I suspect that our idea was, you know, may have been widespread. Yeah, oh, that's cool. No, nah, that, that's cool. Thanks. All right, where were we? Yeah, so the theme here that we can see in the book of Hosea is about God's love. God wants you back. Um, and he uses our earthly marriage union to illustrate uh, the spiritual un uh, unity of God and his people. And however, we can, as we can see in chapter 1, God uses a strange marital relationship to represent the spiritual unity of him and his people. So question, who did God ask Hosea to marry? What kind of woman in chapter 1 verse 2? Oh, yeah. Yep, harlotry. So a wife of harlotry and he married Gomer, uh, the daughter of Diblam. So... Gomer's marital infidelity is a picture of Israel's idolatry and unfaithfulness to its covenant with God. And the story follows that Gomer bore him three children, each of whom has a symbolic name. We have Jezreel, a reminder of the atrocities that had occurred uh, at, Jez uh, at Jezreel, the place. And God will soon judge Israel for these sins appropriately through a military defeat at this same city. And Lo Ruhamah, uh, which is not love or no mercy. So that's foreshadowing the Lord's rejection of Israel. And then you have Lo 
am I, or Ami, however you call that. What does it mean? Anybody uh, know that? Lo Ami. You can see that in chapter 1, verse 8. Yep, that's correct. Not my people. So that's threatening the termination of God's uh, re relationship with his people. So God's sort of go through a divorce with his people for a short period of time, but then he's going to restore them eventually. So in the last two verse, uh, verses of chapter 1, God says that he would restore them. He will not reject his people forever. He will not cast them out forever. God will still fulfill his promise to Abraham, but... It's not until he takes down the kingdom once and for all. And God will discipline his people for their sins. And that brings us to chapter 2. So if we can read uh, from verse 1 to verse 13, probably three uh, verses each. We can start from Lily. So chapter 2, verse 1 to 13, um, but three verses each. Yep, that's correct. Um, bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her hard harlotries from her, from her sight, and her adulteries from between her, her breasts. Let I strip her naked and expose her, as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Upon her children also, I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom, for their mother will, has played the whore. She who received them, oh, sorry, she who conceived them, has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my mothers, who give me my bread, and my water, my wool, <coughs> and my flax, my oil, and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was. I gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bar. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its seasons, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. And I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease. Her feast days, her new moons, her sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her Beasts of the field shall be eaten. I will punish her for the days of the balls for which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot to live for me. Thanks. So in chapter 2, you might ask, where's the love of God? And the answer is that you can find it in verse 1. In verse 1, God says, uh, God calls the sinners to turn back to him, even though his heart was wounded. So if you remember the children of Hosea that we just covered uh, earlier in the recap, Lo, am I is not my people, and lo, Ruhama is no mercy. So God is saying, you are my people, and I'll show you mercy. So it's like a mixed message. Um, one part you're saying that I have nothing to do with you, and then you turn a page later or a chapter later, you're telling me that I'm yours, and that you'll show me mercy. But that's because God, even in moment of disciplining his people, he does not like to do it. He doesn't want to distance himself. He wants you to come back to him. So parents might know this. You don't like to discipline your kids. You don't like to be stern, but then, yet, you have to be stern. It hurts you more than it hurts them when you discipline your kids. And in verse 2, God is saying, Listen, I want you children to listen to me. Your mom has sinned against me, um, and 
and I want you to contend this. She spat in my face and then she walked out on me. So what do we have here in verse 2? A broken home. So God wanted Israel to follow, but Israel didn't want to. And then in verse 3, he weighs out the privileges. He removes them based on the choices. So it's like, if she's going to continue with this uh, and put shame on the family, I'll bring shame on her. In verse 5, we can see that God accurately diagnosed willful disobedience. Um, so he says, For their mother has played the harlot. Uh, she who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. So one thing for those who used to walk with God but then walk away and drifted away from God is that they go chasing after fulfillment in other things to replace what God has already given them. And interestingly enough, God's judgments are purposeful. In verse 6, uh, he says, I will put a hedge up her way and build a wall against her. So one of the ways that I can help her is to hedge her in, to protect her from her. So it's like protecting a child from themselves. They can do a lot of damage to themselves by themselves. And so can the person who decides to walk away from God. And then in verse 7, uh, she will chase her lovers but not overtake them. Yet she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. So God is not interested in compounding on your wrongs. He's interested in getting you back. What happens if I don't listen? Because that's from verse 8 to verse 13. And here's the result of uh, willful disobedience. She'll forget. So in verse 8, she does not know that it was I who gave her grain. So they forget how they got what they got. They forget uh, how they got to where they are and they willfully deny their past and therefore they don't understand how they got the blessings that they've got. So the grains, the prosperity, they forgot that it was from God, not Baal, not other idols that they uh, worship. In verse 9, not only that, I would take away the material things that they've gained from walking with me. So in verse 9 it says, I will take back my grain. And then in verse 10, I will uncover her lewdness. So one of the things that happens as God moves us towards judgment is that he exposes our flawed reasoning. He begins to show just how ridiculous our reasoning is, and hopefully that will bring us back to him. But often we, are bl we blind ourselves and blunt our minds. And if we look at verse 11, um, so we, we lose our joy. It says, I will end her joy. I will shut down the happy, joyful times when she was walking with me. And verse 12 says, I will also wither her future. I will shut down her vines and fig trees. I will let other people reap the benefits and I'm going to withdraw my relationship. And in verse 13, it says, I will punish her for the days of the bells to which she burnt incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewellery and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. So when I sin as a believer, I don't hate God. I, don't, I just forget about Him. I forget that He's holy. I forget that He's watching. I forget that I'm His. I just forget. And then the next question you would ask is, are there any steps to rest restoration? What do I do if I decide to return? So that's the next section of chapter 2, from verse 14 to verse 23. If uh, we can get uh, Adrian to start for us, three verses each as well, from verse 14 to verse 23. Therefore, behold, I will lure her, will bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. And in verse 17, Wendy, is it, are you okay to read that? Wendy? Not the phone to read it. <laughs> when is it okay if you read from, uh, from verse 17 to verse 19?
they will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of you and will make them to lie down safely. Thanks. And any Suf? And I will betroth you to me forever, and I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, I declare the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and I shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and I will have mercy or no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and I will say, and he, and he shall say, you are my God. Thanks. So what are the steps of restoration? So there are four things that you should know if you want to come back. First one is in verse 14. Uh, God meets us in the ash pile. So God is not waiting for us to get up, get clean up before you can come back to him. He says, come back to me, and I'll get you out of the ash pile that you're in. Um, so in verse 14 to verse 15, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her, uh, will bring her into, into the wilderness and speak comfort to her, or speak kindly to her. I'll give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Echo as a door of hope. So the valley of Echo um, is the valley of weeping and suffering. So God is saying that he'll make her suffering and weeping into a door of hope. God is saying, I'm going to walk her back. I'm going to woo her back. God says that I'm interested. I'm interested in you. Even though when you are, even though, uh, even when you are out there walking in sin, I'm still trying to get your attention. I want you back. And that's a, one of the greatest things about God. And then the second step uh, can be found in verse 15 to, and verse 16. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. So I'm going to woo you back and you're going to recognize me and notice and you're going to call me, that's my man, that's my husband. God desires a relationship with us even though when we're in the middle of sin. And it's, it is important to know that. It is not when we wake up one day and reform our lives and then God then pay attention to us. It's the opposite. God's been wounded all the way through, the walking away that we all have done, but then he's still wooing us back to him. It is God's kindness, it is God's kindness that leads us back to repentance. So when you're sinning and you think you got away with it without any consequences, it's not that he's not paying attention. He's trying to woo you back to him. And third step in verse 18, God arranges rest. The struggle against everyone and everything as you walk away from God uh, makes you tired. And so in verse 18 says, In the day I'll make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow. Um, the bow, yeah. I'm going to bury the warfare that you've been under. Because here's the thing. When you walk away from God, everything fights against you. Um, and you step out there undefended, the whole earth is already crying out to be redeemed. And when you go out there and willfully disobey, you put yourself right in the firing line. Uh, you don't have God's protection because it's not in his best interest to protect you. You're taking shot after shot. Uh, so when he draws you back, the first thing he does is to give you rest and let you heal. Step number four is the rest of chapter two, uh, where God renews and strengthens the relationship. So in verse 19, um, I will betroth you to me forever. And then verse 20, and you shall know the Lord. And in verse 21, the desire to talk to God and to listen to God's answer becomes important to you. When you want to follow God, the connection is that you care about what he's saying and want him to speak or want to understand him. And then there's an empowering, empowering that goes on. And interestingly, if we listen to the testimony of the person who returns to God in verse 23, um, it says, at, at the end of the part, you are my people and they shall say, you are my God. And if you notice in um, verse 1 of uh, chapter 2, it was one-sided. God was calling on and says, my people, and I'll show you mercy. And now 
they answered and acknowledged God and says that you are my God. So the key thing to note is God doesn't wait to get clean uh, for him to come into your life. The classic example is for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not when we were clean. We were never clean. God loves us and even though our sin hurts him, he's still trying to woo us back to him. And then when we finally realize our wrongdoings, um, and perhaps that's when everything and everyone is going against us, that's when we realize that walking with God was so much better. And we turn back to seek him, and that's when we say, that's my husband. Not Baal, not other idols, not other sins, but God. That's our husband. So that's what we can see here. A loving husband, a loving father. When we sin, when we seek other idols, that's like a husband walking in on a cheating wife. Can you imagine how hurt that would be, how upset that would be? And even then, God is still trying to woo us back to him because he loves us. He wants us now despite our condition, even when we are dirty and unkept. He wants us to turn back to him. And that's all I have for this morning. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, let us now close in. The, yeah, sorry. Good then. Yeah. So that word for master is Bali, which is where, or, which was the also worship. referenced the name Baal as a yeah. deity Baal. So it was really a play on words where he says, no longer will you call me my master for I'll take from their mouths the name Baal. So it wouldn't even be a reference. He didn't even want there being any reference of their idea of this Baal worship and what Baal would have meant to them or the people, even though it was master and he is their master he wanted that relationship of a husband yeah. so he didn't want them to even think about Baal or that relationship at all thanks and Brother Booning uh, yes, now when we read uh, Osiah uh, it would be quite natural that we have a lot of sympathy for him let's go back to chapter <coughs> 1 I will read from verse 2 now when the Lord first spoke to Osiah <coughs> The Lord first spoke, not the second time, not the third time. So then, from what the Lord asked uh, for Sarah to do, we can see that God uh, would take, I would call, extreme measures to call this uh, <coughs> Judah. Now, if you were to put in the position of Josiah, if God were to ask me to marry a woman of Poland, I would expect strong disapproval from my parents, you know, my, my siblings, my friends, my relatives. And that is exactly what Josiah did in verse 3. So he went and took Koma, the daughters, no question asked. Compare him with Jonah. Well, even Jonah not the extreme. When God asked Jonah, you go north to Nineveh. He stayed to Ben West. You know? But that's not what the Hosea was Hosea did. And also the naming of his children, to be honest, and very embarrassing. That would make his children really kill. Because all the three names as we know the meaning of the three names. I mean, no, no father would name his children that kind of names. You know? Can you imagine, for example, a father named his son Hitler or Judas? Because that would make his son ridiculous. But that is exactly what uh, Hosea did. So in this regard, Hosea, <coughs> we must say, not only a, a man of great faith, he was very, very faithful. And that makes this book very remarkable. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like, he's obedient. 
unlike the people of his time where they are willfully disobedient. Are there any comments or questions yet? Yeah. Okay, Nkun. And you can also sort of say that there's a correlation with prosperity and uh, God's people listening or in the Old Testament anyway. Um, there's sort of a correlation where when people are happy and everything is good, they forgot about God. And then when they're in uh, trouble, then they will think of God and cry out to God. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good point. Any other question or comments? If not, we are closing the word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you Lord for this beautiful morning that we can come here to sing praises to you and also uh, to study on uh, the book of Hosea. Father, we thank you Lord for your word and we thank you Lord for the deep love that you have for us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And his blood, with his blood our sins were washed away. We pray that you'll be with each and every one of us here, that our faith will be strengthened and increase our understanding so that we can rightly divide your word. We pray as we are about to start the worship session that um, you help us to cast aside all worries and cares of this world and to focus solely on worshipping you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone.
Good morning, everyone. If we could please take a seat and we'll sing our choruses this morning. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you. I'll hand the song leading over now. Uh, sing song 535, The Glory Land Way. Song 535. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer fall. I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wondrous, come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clear and full. I'm in the glory land. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for I'm in the glory land way. And the song before we have the opening prayer is song 700 and se- uh, 778. Be with me, Lord. Song 778. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try. 
try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lead myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if dangers threaten, if storms of trial burst above my head, if flashing seas leap everywhere about me, gift or blessing thou couldst bestow could with this one compare a constant sense of thy abiding presence where'er I am to feel that Thou art near. Be with me, Lord, when loneliness overtakes me, when I must weep amid the fires of pain, and when shall come the of my departure for worlds unknown O Lord be with me then Let's go to our Father for prayer. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> we come before thee in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as Christians on the Lord's day, together in this church building to sing songs to glorify thy name. And Father, we thank thee for the Bible lesson we had before the worship service. And we thank Brother uh, Kong Chu for a great lesson that he shared with us. So continue to bless us that the service, <clears throat> the worship service will bring even greater glory to thy name. And Father, we thank thee for the good news that we read in the newsletter. We thank thee, Brother Ivan has been granted a permanent visa. And Father, we also thank thee that Brother Shane and Sister Cathy have found a home in the location of preference. And all these give us the assurance, the confidence, the power of prayer. <clears throat> and that thou will answer our prayer in accordance with our will. So, Father, because of this confidence, we continue to pray for veterans who are physically not strong and bless them. <clears throat> for we acknowledge it is very, very important to be spiritually healthy, to be spiritually strong. But, Father, we also believe that it would help in our Christian life that we be strong physically also. Bless each and every one of us that we be strong spiritually and physically. 
And Father, we also ask that thou bless our speaker this morning, Brother Quinton. We are looking forward to listening another great lesson from him. And we always appreciate all the Bible teachers, the sermon speakers, the love for thy word, the willingness to share what they have learned, their knowledge. So help us that we are becoming better Bible students. All these things, Father, we give thanks in thy Son, our Savior, the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The next song is song 479. Peace, perfect peace. Song 479. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace, by song before we have the Lord's Supper and Collection is song 382. Why did my Saviour come to earth? Song 382. Why did my Saviour come to earth and to the humble sing his praise and then to glory go 
had ran with him through endless days because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He, me so. he gave his precious life for me, for me. Because he loved me so. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I read from Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 37. And these were the words of Jesus to his disciples and the multitudes and follow the incident of Peter's attempt to dissuade him from the path of the cross. Now, Peter appealed to Jesus to spare himself. Peter's, admonitions, uh, as, sorry, Peter's admonition springs from loving concern, but it is met with a stern and severe rebuke from Jesus. So Jesus utterly rejects Peter's suggestion and actually ascribing it to Satan and then says to Peter, in the verse before, you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. And here Jesus set forth a contrast between two life principles. The first one is God's interest, and the second is man's interest. And he revealed that the two are in conflict with one another, but he leaves us no doubt as to which principle dominated his life. Jesus' life was not governed by his own interests, but those of his fathers, as he himself stated over and over again, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John chapter 6, verse 38. Self-interest is the very antithesis of the life of Christ, and his one holy mission was the will of God. For the glory of God, even if it meant persecution, suffering, and death on the cross. So there is the stark contrast here between man's interest and God's interest. And it also forms the context which Jesus teaches about the cross and what it means to follow him. Being his follower means adopting the same attitude towards our lives that he had towards his after calling the multitudes and the disciples to himself, Jesus says that if any man would come after him, he must do three things. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. And what does this mean? First one, deny self. And this means turning from self-will, renouncing, living for self. It is to say no to self and yes to Christ. To repudiate self and acknowledge Christ. Second one, take up the cross. A cross is an instrument of death and is used in a metaphorical sense by Jesus when the term is used in conjunction with the phrase deny self. It carries the idea of dying to our right, to ourselves, and of living to promote our own interest. So in other words, the attitude to self is that of crucifixion. Every day, the Christian is to die. Every day, the Christian renounces his, the sovereignty to his own will. And every day, he renews his unconditional surrender to Jesus Christ. And the third, follow me. So the tense in this verb indicates that 
to continually follow, according to Theus Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. Okay, it means to join one as a disciple, to become or be his disciple. So to follow Jesus, therefore, means to death to self. Uh, sorry, means a death to self to become his disciple. I cease to live for my sake in order that I might live for his sake. So why this imperative call to deny self, take up a cross and follow Jesus? Verse 35 says, Whoever saves his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the Gospels, the same shall save it. So the key here is the word lose. And in Greek, this word is also translated as perish in other parts of the New Testament. The Lord is not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance, 2 Peter chapter 3, to verse 9. And the verse that we are so familiar with, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. So, to ensure that we fully understand the issues, Jesus further explained and emphasizes his points in verse 36 to 37. For what, prof, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So Jesus is saying that if a man does not deny himself, take up a cross and commit to be his follower or his disciple, then that man will perish. He will forfeit his soul. And Jesus makes this same point again in John chapter 10, verses 27 to 28, where he once again uses the word follow as a characteristic of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. So who are the true sheep of our Lord Jesus? Who are the ones who hear his voice, to whom he gives eternal life, and who will therefore never perish? It is those of us who call ourselves Christians, who have committed ourselves to him to become his disciples. And this issue is one of eternity and salvation. And um, let us reflect upon this as we um, go to our Lord in prayer. Great mighty God, hallowed be your most holy and precious name. Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning, this opportunity that we can all be gathered here again to worship you, to offer you our hymns of praise, and also at this moment to be able to commemorate the death of your Son that brought us our salvation. So, Father, as we partake of this unleavened bread that symbolizes the broken body of your Son that hung on the cross for us, we ask you, Father, to help us reflect upon his death and to examine ourselves um, and that we may partake of this unleavened bread in a pleasing manner to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let us now eat of the unleavened bread together. Almighty oh, Heavenly Father, Father, at this moment, so we'd like to thank you for this uh, fruit of the vine, uh, the cup that bears of it that symbolizes the blood of your Son that washed our sins away. And also, Father, we pray for your forgiveness for the times that we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We pray, Father, that you continue to renew us and to guide us back to your ways that we may live our lives that is a reflection of your sons. And we pray, Father, that you um, help us remember your son's sacrifice for us as we um, drink from this uh, cup. In just name we pray. Amen. Now let's ring from the cup together. So as we prepare ourselves to give, I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6 to verse 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So this was what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth after boasting about their zeal to the Macedonians and that they were generous and that they were going to help them. And what's the purpose of us giving, us, giving today? It is not to make the church richer so that we can buy bigger buildings. It is not so that we can be rewarded more. <coughs> but we give. As in verse 12 in the same chapter. One is to supply the needs of the saints. 
Another one is for thanksgiving. And the third is because of our obedience as Christians. And it's not because that God needs our money. And how should we be giving? In verse 5, we read that we should give generously and not of grudging obligation. Let's now go to our Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, Father, we are indeed most grateful to you for blessing us in every way, in everything that we have. And Father, we also know that there are many others who have not been as blessed as we have. And we pray, Father, that um, at this moment, we are able to return a portion of what you have blessed us with and to be able to use that to help uh, the brethren who are in need. And we ask you, Father, to uh, help us give uh, happily and also generously as we have uh, proposed in our heart. Just let me pray. Amen. For those that are using songbooks, the Song of Invitation will be Song 948, Song number 948. But before we have the Bible reading and lesson for this morning, we'll sing Song 594. Live for Jesus, Song number 594. Live for Jesus, O oh my brother, his disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord should be. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross the world's Redeemer Gave his life that thou mightst live Live for Jesus, wandering sinner Under Satan serve no more Of the promised prize a winner Thou mayst be when life is all. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross the world's Redeemer gave his life that thou mightst live. 
Live for Jesus in thy morning at the noon tide I'll be his and at if when day is turning and in hell endless bliss live for Jesus live for Jesus give him all thou hast to give on the cross the world's redeemer gave his life that thou might live today's scripture reading will be from Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 19. Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 19. Verse 16. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what, am I, what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Morning church. Warm well, welcome to everyone this morning. And as you can see, the title of this morning's lesson is A Call to Be Responsible. And obviously, as I know what's coming up, and I know the lesson I'm presenting, as uh, someone who's speaking, you listening out, you've your mind sort of geared towards what you're going to be talking about. And I was even thinking this morning how many times each of us, in one way, shape, or form, have been called to be responsible. I thought about uh, Brother Booning's prayer as he prayed. And the responsibility, I think a little bit unnecessarily, he put on me to uh, deliver a great lesson. <laughs> so um, I'll do my best. But being responsible, the my goal for this morning's lesson is really to encourage each and every one of us to take a moment to look at our lives and I hope that this lesson encourages each of us to be responsible and to maybe take just a few pointers out of this on how to be responsible and what does it mean to be responsible. This is a picture of um, what they call Horseshoe Falls. Um, so it's a it's a part of the Niagara Falls sort of outlet. And um, I don't know how good it would come out on that projector, but sort of there's a line that runs through there where Canada's on the one side and USA is on the other side. And this is a viewing point from the Canadian border. And as you can see, you can literally see the falls right in front of you as you're standing there at this viewing point looking over the river. In, on the 29th of August in 1981, Hisham Saig, unfortunately, was a two-month-old boy who was accidentally dropped on the other side of that railing and was never found again. Her mother's name was, unfortunately, became notoriously known around the world, Dunaya Saig and she was a resident of Toronto. She accidentally dropped her son the other side of that railing. And I see a lot of open mouths as we consider a whole range of questions that immediately spring into our minds. Um, this young lady uh, was uh, obviously a deal of a court case, a manslaughter case. Did she do it on purpose? She was eventually let off. Um, and in that court case, it was revealed that she, um, uh, she was a really paranoid mother. In fact, she had been given uh, medication to try and 
calm her down um, as a new mother. And the questions that sort of come over to, into my mind is what parent would actually be holding their kid on the other side of those railings? You know, where is the responsibility in that? And while I don't want to put too much blame on her, because I'm pretty sure she suffered enough, irrespectively, when we look at being responsible, being responsible is thinking about what you should be doing and what you need to be doing. So, obviously, uh, looking at analogies and things to really bring home this point of being responsible in, in each of our roles, I came across this, uh, came across, sorry, this article by Georgia, I don't know if I spelled, uh, pronounced that correct, correctly, Turovic, um, and um, I found a lot of what he said very pertinent to us as a Christian. He obviously didn't um, say anything about the Bible or whatever, but I thought the general act of being responsible, these are really good tips. Responsibility doesn't come at birth. It's something that you is acquired as you age. Now, maybe not necessarily, uh, in my case maybe, but um, certainly irrespective, as we grow with experiences and as we learn about things in life, we certainly view life differently and we make different decisions based on those experiences. You can hear and see a lot of different things, both good and bad, and that is why your sense of responsibility depends solely on you. I can't be responsible for your actions. You cannot be responsible for my actions. We sure we have maybe a responsibility towards each other, but each of us have the responsibility to maintain and behave ourselves in a way that is correct. Responsibility is a skill. You learn it. However, there are different ways of doing so. You shape your personality with your actions. For example, it is you who chooses to be lazy or to get up early every day. If you want to save money or spend it recklessly, you shape your personality with your actions. Your actions, your decisions will ultimately shape the responsibility that you take over your life. It is about proving to yourself that you can be and that you are, in fact, accountable. In the end, again, all of it comes down to your own conscious decision. Therefore, blaming others for your mistakes is out of the question. And I just want to highlight there, it comes down to your own conscious decision. Blaming others for your mistakes is out of the question. Something I'm trying specifically at this point in my life to teach my children as they come to a new stage, I suppose, in their growth, is to stop making excuses for their actions. Everything is a, yes, dad, but. No. No buts. There is no buts. It's your action. It's your decision. It's your choice. Stop making excuses for yourself. So he, that's the sort of his introduction. And he lists five points. Stop making excuses for yourself is point number one in being responsible. Stop complaining is point number two. Learn how to manage your finances. Overcome procrastination. And be consistent and stick to your schedule. When we look at what um, the Lord said about Abraham, he was certainly called with a huge responsibility, if you consider verse 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. Why? That the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Consider the responsibility placed on Abraham here. Consider the covenant that was made with Abraham. All that was to come, all that was to be in the future, was reliant on him carrying out his responsibility, commanding his children, commanding his household in the way that God expected. He was to keep the way of the Lord. He had a responsibility to be obedient. He was to do righteousness and justice. He was to action the Lord's commands. And he was to wait 
for that which God had promised to bring to him. He was to practice patience. And he was to command his children and his household. He had a responsibility to ensure that this perpetuated through his family line. And Abraham didn't make excuses. If you look at Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 21, verse 8 through 13. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on that same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And that matter, sorry, and the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. Abraham had heeded his wife in Genesis chapter 16, verse 2. Sarah was not willing to wait for what the Lord had promised. And Abraham ultimately gave in. He had heeded his wife. And we see that when a husband fails in his responsibility, there's always another responsibility that's less appealing that then has to be followed up on. You see, we all have to take responsibility for our actions. So we can do it right the first time, or it's a lot more hard the second time. And this is where Abraham finds himself in this predicament, and he didn't make excuses. You see, he didn't want uh, to just send his son Ishmael away. He realized he'd made a mistake, but now he had an obligation as a father to look after his firstborn son. God obviously gave him or commanded him and, and told him what to do and told him not to worry. I've got Ishmael. I've got this. Don't worry about it. But Abraham did not want to make any excuses. And Abraham never complained. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 6. But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. You see, God had promised Abraham that this was his country. And God had sent Abraham away. And Abraham heeded the commands of God without complaint. He left his father's household and went to a completely strange land with just himself and his wife and their few possessions when they left. And also, it's kind of difficult to find a verse recording something of someone not doing something. Because that kind of is exactly the opposite of it. So, I don't know of any verses. I, I try to search to make sure that I wasn't caught out afterwards. And if you have one, then come and share it with me that I don't get caught out again. But we don't ever see Abraham complaining about any of the things and God asks him to do some serious things as we're going to look at. Nowhere does Abraham complain. He just gets it done. He gets on with it. Abraham certainly did not procrastinate. That we see um, numerous times in Genesis 17 verses 10 through 14 and verse 23. This is my covenant. Uh, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house, he who is bought with your money, must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant." And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So in verse 23, So Abraham took Ishmael his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, and every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God had said to him. Abraham wasted no time in keeping the commands of God. I cannot imagine that this would have been a happy day for the Israelite nation, all right, especially for the men of the Israelite nation. And yet, Abraham did not procrastinate. He did not waste time. He did it that very same day. And we see a similar uh, pattern in Abraham's life when he was asked to sacrifice his son. 
In Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 3, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Now take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took his two young and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Abraham did not procrastinate. He did it early in the morning. And Abraham was consistent. Genesis chapter 14 verse 13 and 14. Then one who had escaped came and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite brother, sorry, who dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and brother of Anna, and they were allies with Abraham. Now when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, that's Lot, he armed 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 32, we read, Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I'll speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So in the first passage, Abraham goes and rescues his brother Lot from the kings that had taken him captive. And in the second passage, Abraham is pretty much pleading for the life of Lot, his well, nephew or brother, as is referred to him in Genesis 14, but really they were kin, they were family, and that's why I said to his brothers. Abraham consistently looked out for Lot. Now keep calm, because I'm not perfect. And I know that these analogies are maybe not the greatest. I mean, if you think about what we spoke about, right? So, you know, being consistent, not complaining, not procrastinating, um, and uh, being patient. There's, there is lots of examples in the, in the Bible where we see these attributes and the people that we look up to keeping all of these attributes as they were faithful to God and please God. These were people that took their responsibilities. I'm currently studying the book of, uh, or going through the book of Genesis, and I'm, with, um, I'm in that passage with Abraham. What really stuck out to me is that scripture reading that Timothy read for us this morning, where... Uh, God says, I know Abraham, and I know that he will command his children and his household. It's, it, he knew that Abraham would be responsible and would take on that responsibility. But think of maybe some other examples. What about the example of Jesus? You know, even in, with, when uh, Brother Adrian was presenting the Lord's Supper this morning, consider the consistency of Christ and how he maintained his schedule, his time in prayer, his time away, his time for self-reflection, his teaching, his work, all was methodical. It was consistent. It was really, you, could, you almost knew as a, as a reader looking into the life of Jesus, you know in the morning he's going to be praying. You know in the afternoon he's going to be teaching. It was just consistent. God or Jesus on this earth was consistent. He never complained about what was coming up. Yes, he wasn't looking forward to it. But he never complained about it. He was always carrying out the responsibility from, that he was given by his father. And so our calling then is to not make excuses. In Luke chapter 14, verse 16 through 21, Then he said to them, A certain man gave a great supper and invited men, and he sent his servant at supper time, saying to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, of one accord, began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I'll ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I'll ask you to have me excused. And still another, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Let us not make excuses that we find ourselves excused from heaven. We must not make excuses in our Christian walk and in our Christian duties. In Romans chapter 12, uh, 2, sorry, verse 1 through 11. 
Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. For we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent hearts, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and, re and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who will render to each one according to his deeds? Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also for the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. We are not to make excuses that keep us from doing what is good. And we should not be complaining. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 through 11. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by servants. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. We must not complain. We must work with a joyful and appreciative heart in the kingdom of God. We must take on our responsibility with joy and gladness, recognizing what has been done for us. And we must not procrastinate. We see that numerous times that we are to work while we have the opportunity to work. In Acts chapter 16, in verse 25 through 33, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword to, and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do not do yourself no harm. We are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 33, he took them at that same hour of the night, and they were immediate, and they were baptized. Sorry, he took them out the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. They did not procrastinate. And we see the same thing with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verse 36 to 38. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded, in verse 38, the chariot to stand still in both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and they baptized him. And what about Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 15? Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, sorry, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in the departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. We are to work today. We should not be procrastinating. And we need to be consistent in our work for God, in our work and in our walk with and for Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 
verse 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, we see that the disciples and the apostles met daily together. They were consistent in their work every day giving themselves to the Lord's work. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 through 2, we see Paul instructing Timothy to be ready to preach the word in season and out of season, convincing, rebuking, exhorting with all long-suffering and teaching. In season and out of season, Timothy was to be consistent in his work. We are to be consistent in our work in our calling to be responsible Christian citizens. We need to work and to challenge ourselves to stick to what God has called us to, to know what God has called us to, and to continue being faithful Christians. And if you have not yet accepted the gospel calling, if you have not yet obeyed through the waters of baptism, being united with Christ in this matter, please don't hesitate. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Use this opportunity to come into a relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please consider these words. Challenge yourselves as we stand and have our closing hymn together. Thank you. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord by side. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go. To the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. Please be seated. We'll have the closing prayer. Thank you, everyone. Let us uh, close in the word of prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty Father in heaven, Hallowed be thy name for you, the one and only Almighty God, that's all loving, all knowing, all powerful, that you gave your only begotten Son to die on that cross, so that we can have the hope of salvation if we were to believe in the gospel message of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we can be reconciled back to you. 
We thank you then, Father, for your magnificent grace and love for each and every one of us that uh, you have uh, made this uh, way possible for us as mankind, as a whole, to uh, be able to obey you, to be able to uh, come back to you. We pray then, Father, at the, especially now for the uh, worship hour that has passed, we pray that, that we have done it in a manner that is pleasing unto thy sight, which has done it in a manner which is in spirit and in truth that it, and is acceptable uh, to you. We pray then, Father, especially this time for um, the uh, brethren that's out there that are not um, uh, well-to-do in terms of their health or in terms of the problems that they have to go through. Pray then, Father, that um, whoever it may be, that um, you'll be with each and every one of them, especially now so for Arian as she's uh, contracted um, chickenpox. We pray then, Father, that you'll be with her as she uh, begins to recover from it and um, hopefully that she'll be able to come back to uh, full, full health to be able to uh, join us this time. Um, of um, study and fellowship. We thank you, dear Father, for everything you so richly given us, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Um, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us uh, today in this time uh, of uh, study and uh, worship. And I hope you will come back again in the next uh, point of time. Um, there are a couple of updates that I have to go through in terms of uh, what the uh, men's uh, meeting has gone through uh, in Friday that just passed. So just um, uh, give you a quick update. Don't forget um, that the December uh, month has become a uh, sort of like a really busy month now uh, because of uh, you know the camp, uh, the, the family camp that's supposed to happen in July, uh, June, July at the time. But then because it has to be postponed because of uh, circumstances. So therefore, the month of December, there are a couple events that's happening. Ian Coker and his wife Diane is still. Uh, you know, scheduled to come, a uh, lot willing. <laughs> um, everything were to go well and they can come physically to run the gospel meeting that's going to happen from the 10th to 12th of December uh, on the uh, subject matter of uh, why is there suffering and then uh, followed by church lunch on uh, the uh, 12th of December. So um, there's a couple of changes in terms of, um, you know, what's happening in terms of the end of the month lunch. So the end of the month lunch will be brought forth uh, to coincide with the gospel meeting week. So they'll be happening on the 12th of December. Now, 16th to the 18th of December will be the family camp. And um, on the 26th of December, there will not be a church lunch or the usual uh, end of the month lunch. What's going to happen is we're going to um, you know, meet together on the 31st of December uh, on, a new, uh, and on like a New Year's Eve uh, fellowship dinner and also a praise and prayer session at that particular time. So more details will to follow in uh, weeks to come. But that is, um, you know, what is happening in the month of December. So don't forget gospel meeting and the family camp that's happening in the month of December with Brother Ian Coker. And as you all well know, there are new studies that's happening now. Um, on the Sunday morning Bible class uh, for the month of November, at least, Brother Gongjo will be taking uh, a charge in the uh, book of Hosea. And uh, on the Wednesday evening Bible class, Brother Quinton has started on a new series after the long journey on the book of Genesis. <laughs> that is uh, going through the uh, book of uh, Matthew. And a couple of other, um, you know, other things that to, to note, the evangelism committee of the evangelism um, um, branch of the uh, church um, is asking for each and every, when the evangelism committee came together, they uh, decided on cute animals. So the segue would be, if you have any photo of cute animals, Gongjo Hin Hin, <laughs> um, please do forward it um, or send your photo to photo at centralnorthcoc.org.au. Um, uh, you know, and also ensure, you know, make sure you put your name so that we know that you are the one who, uh, you know, send that photo. So out of all the uh, plethora of photos that we have, 12 will be chosen to be uh, put as the uh, theme of the uh, calendar for 2022. So last year was, you know, landscape and all that. So this year will be, um, you know, cute animals or animals, I should say. All right. So please uh, we'll, uh, pick as many as we can, uh, you know, narrow it as many as we can down to uh, 12, and then we'll go from there for the theme of the calendar 2022. Um, don't forget Wednesday night Bible class um, is still ongoing and on the uh, uh, book of Matthew. Um, there's a young adult fellowship that's happening on the Friday, the 12th of November uh, on 6.30 p.m. I'm pretty sure this was the last of the uh, series in the uh, divorce uh, remarriage one and it's um, subject matter on succeeding at remarriage. Um, don't know how that's going to be for those young at heart, you know, join in this particular session. And uh, it's located uh, in the house that is being going to be um, housed at is, will be uh, Ivan and Joanne's uh, residence. All right. So all those uh, young adults, please uh, note that Friday, Friday the 12th of November. And there's also a ladies uh, fellowship on the Saturday, the 13th of November at 7.30 p.m. will be hosted by Auntie Sue. 
Uh, so all ladies are uh, and invited and welcome uh, to join in this particular time of uh, fellowship. Um, also, don't forget, in conjunction with the December events, that is a gospel meeting that's happening in the um, first couple of weeks of the month of December. So there will be a door knocking and letterboxing, letterboxing sorry, uh, session that uh, is being uh, put uh, forth and it is confirmed 100% on the Sunday, the 21st of November. <laughs> All right? So the reason I said that, that, because there was a bit of confusion on the dates, but it is confirmed 100% door knocking and letterboxing, letterboxing sorry, session on the uh, Sunday, the 21st of uh, November at uh, 1 p.m. So the, um, at least the plan will be, you know, after um, worship um, has uh, concluded, those who are interested, you know, stay along for uh, a quick lunch, probably pizza, and after that, you'll proceed towards the, um, the uh, particular event, all right? So don't forget, 21st of November um, in that particular date. Also, one last thing before, um, you know, I finish, I know it's a bit longer than usual, because I got a lot of things uh, to uh, put forth, and then you know, if not, some people will say, "Oh, you know, no one tells us anything." But nevertheless, one last thing would be on the 28th of November, the uh, youth and young adults are trying to uh, host a uh, event for the uh, members of the church, right? And it's a event called a skill building um, event. Oh, sorry, 27, 27 November. This is a Saturday. 27 November, not 28. Sorry, 27 November, the Saturday. The youth and young adults are trying to. Um, uh, organize an event for all the uh, members of the church and your family, friends, whoever that wants to come along for a skill building session. Um, and it's uh, pertaining skills um, like um, a cappella singing, um, how to maintain your car, and also the last one will be something to do with your teeth. <laughs> I'll leave it as that, all right? Any more uh, you know, information that you require, please ask Brother Gerald, and he'll be more than delighted to um, you know, uh, tell you more about it. So don't forget, 21st of November, uh, door knocking uh, evangelistic effort. 27th of November uh, will be the uh, youth and young adults uh, event that a skill building uh, sharing session in that particular time. That's all the uh, um, announcements I have. Have a good week ahead. Thank you. <laughs>